Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. A very sincere welcome to all our guests from the Weinberg family here today. Our boys, parents, principals, other principals from the campus, staff and men of Weinberg. Thank you for coming along to share this very special occasion with us. Arguably the most important ceremony in the life of our school and in the traditions of this 173 year old school. Thank you, Dr. Favot, for agreeing to deliver our John McNaughton address today. After your grandfather, you are the third Favot to be at our school, as obviously your son, Vion, beat you to it when he spent a term with us seven years ago. I'd also like to add a special welcome to Phyllis Friedlander, sitting in the front row here. And the Wellington boys would love to meet you because they currently hold the trophy in your family's name. Everyone in this audience knows the significance of 2014. You've heard about it all morning. And the fact that we are commemorating today two historic events. The similarities between 1914 and 1994 are startling. 1914 saw the start of a war which would change the world forever. 1994 saw the start of a new South Africa which would change this country forever. A hundred years ago seems an impossibly long time to us today. We recall it in black and white, sometimes sepia tones. We have all seen the grainy pictures of soldiers going to war singing, it's a long way to Tipperary. One young soldier, Julian Grenville, young enough still to be at school, where he should have been, wrote back to his mother saying, this is such fun. It's like a picnic. You just don't know where you're going to be. Well, some picnic it was going to turn out to be. In France, in the Battle of the River Somme, over a million men died in the trenches. We have all read over the years with horror the stories of life in those trenches. Some years ago, I took a school trip to the First World War battlefields and we wandered around the area where there had been once so much death and killing. Now it is all peaceful. And the local farmers are growing wheat and barley over those battlefields. We could never have guessed that a war had ever been fought there, except wherever we went, we found road signs, road, road signs indicating yet another immaculately maintained cemetery of war dead. If you kick the soil of those fields, it will not be long before some relic of the war turns up. I'm not sure if it's permissible any longer, but on that trip, I was allowed to take home an empty shell casing, which I'd picked up on the battlefield of Delville Wood, <coughs> in the battlefield where so many South Africans had died, including many whose names we're going to hear read out later today by our head prefect, Rathon Admiral as he fulfills the wishes of Headmaster Edward Littlewood, 96 years ago, who faithfully recorded the names of all his boys who did not make it back from the battlefields of France. That shell casing, which I picked up, is an unexploded gas shell. It's empty in case you were worried. And I have many interesting stories of how I brought it back through five or six airports of Europe, including Tel Aviv. <laughs> I walk past this shell every day when I leave for school. And every day I wonder how many people it would have maimed or killed or disfigured if it had gone off. <clears throat> I contemplate its journey from the factory to the front line. And I think, yet again, it's heavy. A lot of material must have gone into making this one shell. But I think, yet again, what a waste that war was. Surely there could have been a better way. The war is now long gone. But it is largely remembered by us for the senseless destruction of millions of young lives. Young Weinberg boys, just like you. They were among the casualties of Delver Wood. But unlike you 800 boys, they were destined never to realize their potential. 
Of course, a similar sentiment can be said about the wasted potential of millions of young South African lives in an era which came to an end with the inauguration of Nelson Mandela 20 years ago. To encourage enlistment in England in 1914, young men were told that it was their duty to enlist and their mission was to save civilization. Doesn't that sound vaguely familiar to those of us who did military service in South Africa before 1994. The well-known author, H.G. Wells, said, We're on an enterprise on behalf of humankind in this war. We are fighting not for aggressive reasons, but in defense of principles vital to civilization. I'm quite sure that at every stage, at some stage, every Prime Minister of South Africa from 1948 to 1994 made the same point, we are defending civilization. When war was declared by Great Britain on the 4th of August 1914, cheering crowds flocked to Buckingham Palace. The philosopher Bertrand Russell, who was amongst the crowd, later remarked that it was clear that the average man was delighted by the prospect of war. Those cheering crowds had no idea of the carnage to come. No idea that this war would lead to the Second World War. No idea that it would lead to the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, and the Cold War. And they definitely had no idea that it would be directly responsible for the Palestinian crisis in Gaza today. There was a similar cheering crowd in Johannesburg at Jan Smuts Airport in 1960 when the South African Prime Minister, Dr. H. F. Avut, returned from the Commonwealth Conference in London and announced to this cheering crowd that he would be holding a referendum in which he'd be proposing to take South Africa out of the Commonwealth and declare a republic in which only his white compatriots would have the vote. And just as that other cheering crowd, many years before Buckingham Palace, this cheering crowd of South Africans was not to know that, that the next 34 years would be 34 years of political, economic, and sporting isolation. They were not to know that our racial policies were destined to make us the most unpopular country on earth, and that our people would be polarized and torn apart, and we are still recovering. I wonder what that cheering crowd would have thought if they had known that the man they were shortly to incarcerate for 27 years would be president 34 years later. In fact, the name of the very airport where they were cheering was later to be renamed the O.R. Tambo Airport after a leader very few South Africans had even heard of at the time. Now, 54 years on, in 2014, what have we learned? We have definitely learned that the First World War did not succeed in being the war to end all wars. We have learned both from the First World War over the last 100 years and in South Africa over the last 34 years, that our, our version of civilization cannot be saved by wars or by repressive legislation. <laughs> Here at Weinberg, in this hall, in our tutor groups, in our classrooms, in our music rooms, and on our sports fields, we are learning every day that respect for other cultures, religions, and viewpoints is the only way to build a school and a country. Today, is our Founders Day. It is the day we pay tribute to the builders who have served our school over the last 173 years. We pay tribute to the 13 headmasters, the hundreds of teachers, the thousands of pupils, and later old boys, and the hundreds of thousands of parents who have enabled us to stand proudly in 2014 and say regardless of whatever background we come from, we are Weinberg men. Earlier this week on television, President Obama reminded the peoples of the world that our sole purpose on earth is to build. Today is Weinberg's day to reaffirm, reaffirm the belief that we have learned from the divisions of the past. Today, we commit ourselves to building our school into a better place, to building our communities into better places, and to build meaningful relationships with one another. Doing all this enables us to build our country into the special place we all want it to be.